when I was 10, I got a telescope for my birthday. A few weeks after that, Apollo 8 circled the moon on Christmas Eve. It was the first time people had ever left Earth orbit. This was so cool, here as we said in 1968. I could take my telescope, I could point it at the moon, and I could know I was looking at the same place that we had people circling. How cool is that? Later, the next July, I was still 10, I still had my telescope, and Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. Now, we had another phrase back then, out of sight. That was out of sight. Science was cool. I loved science. It made the moonshot possible. But more important, I loved the wonder of it all. You could lean back and look up at the heavens. Try it. When you do, you'll notice that your mouth opens naturally in awe. I loved what science could tell me about this. I could look at this universe of infinite possibility, twinkling with stars, and science could tell me how it worked, where it came from. Science didn't diminish the magic. It magnified it. It made it cooler. But remember, I was 10, and so what I really wanted was to be an astronaut. Now, I grew up on a farm, and so I would go to the backyard of my parents' farmhouse, and I would take this metal lawn chair, and I would lay it on its back, pointed toward the heavens, astronaut style, and I would put on my coveralls, because that's as close as I could get to a flight suit, and I would take a mason jar of Tang, the drink of astronauts, and I would be ready for liftoff. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six. I took a swig of Tang and went up my nose. I assumed that wasn't going to be a problem when I really was an astronaut because they would have better Tang delivery systems or maybe weightlessness. Something would help me out here. So that wasn't a problem. What happened a few months later was a problem. I got glasses, bifocals. Didn't take a rocket scientist to know I was not going to be an astronaut while I was wearing bifocals. Did this crush the soul and the dreams of a 10-year-old? Nah, the 1969 Cubs did that. But, but I figured, you know, the Cubs, they're going to get to the World Series. Oh, oh, wait. Anyway, I kept asking questions, but they took a different kind of form. Instead of, why can't I be an astronaut? Because that was an easy answer. I wore bifocals. I started the other kinds of questions. Why is the sky blue? Why don't we feel the Earth moving as it hurtles through space? I loved asking and trying to answer these questions. And I loved math. I loved science because it provided those answers. But I also loved writing because in writing, you're explaining. When you write, whether it's the great American novel and talking about the human condition, or whether it's a repair manual for how to fix your dishwasher, what you're really doing is explaining. So I was an aspiring writer, and as I went through my primary and high school career and got ready for college, I did what aspiring writers do. I majored in math. And then I found out why aspiring writers don't major in math. Because I was good at math and science, compared with people who weren't majoring in math and science. So I had to redirect my undergraduate career a little bit, but I still took lots of science courses, including astrophysics. And astrophysics asks and answers some really big questions, like the Big Bang. And I found that I could explain those concepts and principles to lay people who hadn't studied that and didn't understand it at first. And that's how I became a journalist, because I realized if I could explain something to someone, I first had to understand it myself. Now, there's this old cliche about superstars in sports having difficulty becoming coaches. Why? Because it just came naturally to them. They steal a phrase from Nike, just did it. 
They don't know how, they just did it. Science can be like that sometimes. If you have an intuitive feel for science, it can be hard to step back from that and explain to others how it works. As you might guess, I didn't have that problem because it was easy for me not to understand how it worked. So when I tried to explain a scientific principle, I could always look at that eager beginner and it was basically like looking at a selfie or looking in the mirror because that beginner was me. So that was kind of cool. But then I realized I still had that sense of wonder and I still have it to this day. When I go out at night and walk my two colleagues and look up at the moon, I still think, wow, we got there and science took us there. Now, at the Tampa Bay Times, I edit a Sunday section called Perspective and I edit the daily op-ed page. And when the BP oil spill happened, because I like science, I thought, well, part of my responsibility as a journalist and part of my interest as a human being and a resident of the Tampa Bay area is to try to explain the BP oil spill to our readership. So here's the kind of stuff we did. We said, well, let's pretend the crude oil is actually gasoline. And let's take that volume of gasoline and let's tank up a Honda Accord and Let's start it running. Now, remember, it's a hypothetical Honda Accord. It's not a real one. But we said if you start driving that car when Columbus set sail, you'd be running out of gas. So, yeah, about now. We also took the area of the surface of the spill and transposed it onto the Tampa Bay area to give people a sense of how big the spill was. So those are the kinds of things we did to try to make the spill real to our readers. In some sense, it was unfulfilling. I just couldn't put my finger on it. And it took five years for that to happen. And here's why. As the five-year anniversary loomed, marine scientists at the University of South Florida, who had a, a group called Sea Image, which had studied the spill and its effects for five years, came to me, remember I'm the op-ed editor, and wanted to write a piece about their findings. And I encouraged that because I thought that was a good idea. Our readership should know about that. But that's when it hit me. And this time, my sense of wonder wasn't the awe of looking up at the night sky, my mouth agape, and the wow. It was more, I wonder why. And that's when it hit me. When you are standing on the beach towns here in the Tampa Bay area and looking west, Science told you there was a horrible oil spill out in the Gulf of Mexico, directly west of us. My senses looked out there, and I looked, and I smelled, and you know what I sensed? Nothing. Nothing. Now, that made no sense to me. I've always trusted science. I've always figured it would give me the right answer over time. The scientific method will always get it right through many trials, many errors, but will always get it right. Individual scientists, yeah, maybe not, but science writ large will get it right. So my senses were telling me one thing, science was telling me another. How to make sense of this? Well, the USF scientist helped me a great deal. Here was what I thought. I thought, okay, if we look at the Gulf of Mexico as a bathtub, fill it with water, now we're going to have an oil spill. So how can we sort of think of that commonsensically? Okay, I'm going to take a can of soda pop because you can shake it up and it'll be carbonated and it'll spill and it'll shoot out, right? But instead of soda pop, we're going to use motor oil. Just pretend it's still carbonated so it's under pressure. It's kind of like coca oil. Think of it that way. So I shake this up, put it at the bottom of the tub, pop the top, and see what happens. Well, the oil is going to spew out and it's going to go to the surface and you're going to have this nasty spill on the surface. And I thought, well, that's a pretty good analogy, right? Well, everything I just said is pretty much totally, completely wrong. Here's what really happened. Okay, the floor of the Gulf of Mexico is a mile down. In human terms, that's a, as far away as the surface of the moon. You can't get there. There's so much pressure, you couldn't live there. It's so far down, there's no light there. It's an alien world. So when the oil spill happened, as I discovered with the good scientists telling me what really did happen, it wasn't anything like motor oil at all. And even crude oil comes in many different forms, and it's not just crude oil. There are petrochemicals. 
Some of them, it turns out, actually are water soluble. So in that case, water and oil mix. There was so much pressure that some of the oil was atomized into droplets so small, it never got to the surface. When I think of an oil spill, I think of something rising to the surface and spreading out. Some of that happened, some of it didn't. Some of the oil did get to the surface, and when it got there, there were sea organisms, plankton and the like, and under stress, they released something. I have to look up my notes. It's a technical term, sea snot. And that sea snot didn't save their lives. They still died, but it made them sticky. And so the oil and the plankton and the sea snot all globbed together. And then people trying to keep the oil from going inland op literally opened the floodgates and that fresh water came out. But with the fresh water came sediment and clay. And guess what? That stuck to the sea snot, that stuck to the oil, and it all snowed to the bottom. And I have to look at my notes again because this is a technical term in a dirty blizzard, dirty blizzard. And so instead of oil spreading out like that, you had different plumes at different levels and all these horrible things happening sub rosa, out of view, we didn't even see them. I, as a layperson, was thinking of the oil spill as a slick just on the surface. That wasn't it at all. That was part of it, but that wasn't it. So what the USS scientists and sea image did for me was take me down below the ocean, a place I will never go in the same way that because of my bifocals, now progressive lenses, I will never go to the moon either. But science took me to both places. And now I have an understanding of what happened. And I understand how bad the spill was, even though my senses didn't pick it up. Science, as it always did, got to the bottom of the story. And that is a wonder of its own. Thank <laughs> you.